Uh, for those of you in the audience, the screen behind you is, is uh, pretty high quality. I want to thank you all for this invitation. Um, we're going to walk through a lot of material, a lot of content, and uh, I, uh, I think we've scheduled enough time at the end for questions. So uh, you'll notice the title of my talk is the next few years will be the most important in human history. And um, I think that you'll understand why I draw this conclusion uh, by the time we finish. So this is our atmosphere. It's extremely thin. And it uh, traps heat that comes in from the sun in what's known as a natural greenhouse effect. And if we didn't have a natural greenhouse effect, uh, the temperature, the average temperature on Earth would be below freezing. So the greenhouse effect naturally uh, is extremely important to life. When sunlight hits uh, a bright surface, such as a snow or ice covered surface, it will be reflected back out to space. And it won't do any work. It won't do it, provide any energy in our climate system. But when it hits a dark surface, like a body of water, for instance, the ocean or um, continent that is not covered by ice, it sends, it warms up that surface and then that heat rises up through the atmosphere and that heat is trapped by a group of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide uh, being one that has a long residence time in our atmosphere of several centuries. Carbon dioxide traps this heat and then re-radiates it, some of it going back down to Earth, so you're twice warming the planet's surface. It's like putting an extra blanket on your bed. And if we were to increase uh, the amount of carbon dioxide, for instance, or methane or other greenhouse gases, it's like putting three or four or five or 10 blankets on your bed. You know, it's, it's too much of a good thing. And the most powerful greenhouse gas is actually water vapor. Uh, but the, o the only way to um, quasi-permanently increase water vapor is to warm the air. As you know, when it's warmer out, it's also more humid. Uh, so it turns out that for every degree of warming you get from the primary greenhouse gases, you get an additional degree of warming from the water vapor that is now uh, the humidity in the air. This is called a feedback effect, and these feedback effects are very important. These greenhouse gases come from every sector of our socioeconomic activities, uh, agriculture, commercial and residential activities, industry, transportation, generating electricity. And uh, carbon dioxide has the longest lifetime of these, so it's the one that we focus on the most. And you can see here on this graph from 1880 up to present day that CO2 uh, has increased on the right graph um, it's actually increased, uh, a measurement last March was 415 parts per million. And at the same time, lagging a little bit behind, the temperature of the air has warmed as well. And you can see that there are, uh, this is a very jagged red line, the upper points are hot years, and these are typically associated with El Nino events, and the lower points are cold years, and these are typically associated with La Nina events or strong volcanic eruptions. Uh, the rate of warming is accelerating. The rate of CO2 accumulation is accelerating. Uh, we've currently warmed the atmosphere about two degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't strike you as very much, but you should really think of it in terms of your body temperature. If you were running a two degree fever, uh, it's a low-grade fever, but what if it never goes away? It would start to uh, degrade your organs. It would uh, eventually lead to brain damage. So even as little as two degrees Fahrenheit of warming can have a fundamentally profound impact on a system that is governed by temperature, such as uh, our ecosystem and our weather system. The projections are that in one decade from now, we'll be warming uh, 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, and before 
mid-century, the warming will reach 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the data collected by NASA around uh, Earth's surface beginning in the late 1800s and coming up to present day. You can see it's highly variable, uh, but overall there's a long-term warming trend. One of the uh, important aspects of this long-term warming trend is that the Arctic is warming faster than any place else, twice as fast as the rest of the planet. Uh, and this Arctic amplification is having severe effect on the jet stream and is controlling our weather, which I'll get to in a minute. Also notice that bright blue spot at the uh, top of the North Atlantic Ocean. As Dr. Bugby mentioned, um, this is slowing what's known as the conveyor belt. It's a current uh, that comes up along the east coast of the U.S. Part of it is known as the Gulf Stream. That current takes heat out of the tropics and exports it up to the North Atlantic and releases it so that England and Northern Europe have a much um, warmer climate than they would otherwise. But this blue spot is fresh water that's coming off of Greenland because the ice sheet on Greenland is melting. And that fresh water is slowing the current it's, in, it's slowed, in fact, between 15 and 18 percent. And the implications of this are that less heat is being exported from the tropics, which means the temperature of the tropics is rising, the sea surface temperature is rising, and this is fuel for hurricanes. And we see hurricanes now every summer reaching Category 5, Category 4 and 5. This used to be a rare thing. Plus, we see hurricanes ramping up from tropical cyclone status up to a category four or five in the space of 48 hours. We've never seen that before. So slowing the conveyor belt means less heat is uh, being dispersed and the South Atlantic also is warming and that's providing uh, heat associated with melting Antarctic ice. All these systems are interconnected. With so far only two degrees Fahrenheit of warming, we've already documented sea level rise with a 10% probability of reaching two meters or six and a half feet by the end of this century. Antarctica is melting three times faster than last decade. Greenland is melting two times faster than last decade. The Arctic sea ice volume is down 50 to 70 percent since we first started monitoring it by satellites in 1979. There's a 12 percent global increase in extreme rainfall, which of course leads to flooding. There's a 10 percent increase in uh, the land area that is under drought. 66 percent of humans face a water shortage for at least one month each year currently. There's a decrease in atmospheric circulation, an unstable jet stream, as I'll show you, a decrease in ocean vertical circulation, which is what we just talked about. The ocean is warming. Uh, it is absorbing CO2, which is causing it to acidify, and it's also losing dissolved oxygen, the thing that fish have gills for. So um, that's a fundamental change. Global wildlife population has decreased by 60% in recent decades, and we have marine and terrestrial extinctions taking place. Hurricanes are bigger, wetter, slower, and intensifying literally overnight. This very steep curve is the release of carbon dioxide by uh, humans since 1850 up to present day. If we want to stop warming, at two degrees centigrade, which is, on the, which is about 3.8 degrees Fahrenheit. If we want to stop warming, uh, we need to do that with our CO2 emissions. They need to drop like a stone. And we need to cut global CO2 emis emissions 50%, 5-0% every decade until mid-century and uh, be at zero by mid-century, zero global emissions. And because the developing nations of the world want new hospitals and roads and schools and secure fresh water and food systems, 
they should be allowed to continue to burn fossil fuels to reach the same quality of life that we have reached, which means that the developed nations need to be to zero emissions in 10 years, allowing the developing world to continue some emissions. Unfortunately, Shell, Exxon, and Mobil have doubled down on their industry. Uh, they have announced uh, that they and the other 50 largest oil companies are dumping 7 million barrels per day on the market, uh, which reduces their stranded assets, their oil that's in the ground, allows them to pump it out faster. It keeps the price of oil cheap. It keeps us addicted. And at the same time, they're planning new explorations in the Barents Sea, uh, the North Sea, uh, the Caribbean, in Kazakhstan. And they know and now publicly acknowledge uh, the reality of climate change. So we have two narratives. We have rising CO2 emissions guaranteed by the oil giants, which is all those orange and yellow lines. And then we have what we need to do, which is that one black line going down. Unfortunately, the global investment in renewable energy is down about 20% in the last four or five years. And a report just came out late last week from the International Energy Agency, and it plots CO2 emissions to mid-century on the bottom axis and the demand for new energy on the vertical axis. In 1990, our CO2 emissions we're a little above 20 billion tons per year. Today, our emissions are uh, at about 40 billion tons per year, all things taken into account. The projection by 2040 is to continue current practices and the news from the oil companies I just told you about is guaranteeing that. But if we want to stop warming, um, that's the direction we need to go. Our emissions have to drop again like a stone. A special word about agriculture, which is responsible for 31% of our emissions from cradle to grave. Since 1970, food crop production has increased 300%, and half of all agricultural expansion has come at the expense of forests. The food supply chain is responsible for about 26% of greenhouse gas emissions and the other 5% from non-food agriculture like biofuels and textiles. 43% of all ice and desert-free land on this planet, two-thirds of all fresh water is used for food production because of our exploding human population. And we use synthetic pesticides and nutrients which uh, are used to excess. They run off into the watershed and they create over 400 dead zones around the world now at the mouths of major rivers. We also farm inappropriately. We use deep plowing to open the soil to the air, which means that carbon in the soil finds oxygen in the air and creates CO2. So our farming is actually releasing CO2 from our soil if we had a different type of farming practice, soil would be absorbing CO2 and working with us. Beef is a special aspect of agriculture. It generates 100 times more greenhouse gas than plant-based foods. Over 80% of farmland is used for livestock, but it produces just 18% of food calories and 37% of protein. Cattle plus the grain they eat use one-third of available land surface on this planet. 16% of all available fresh water. One-third of worldwide grain production. And we are deforesting the planet in order to grow more corn and run more cattle at a rate of 30 football fields per minute because of the beef industry. That was just the introduction. These are the chapters I'm gonna walk through. The next thing we're gonna look at is natural climate change. 
We know how nature works because layers of snow that have turned to ice in Antarctica and Greenland trap bubbles of air going back 800,000 years. And we core through these layers of snow and we get ice cores containing these little bubbles of air. We put them in a vacuum, we melt them, we trap that air and we analyze those little samples. And on the bottom axis of this graph, you'll see 800,000, that's years ago. And on the vertical axis is carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million. At first, this may look like a totally random and jagged line, but actually there's a regular rhythm to it. These low periods in carbon dioxide are ice ages. Again, carbon dioxide controls the thermostat or the temperature of the atmosphere. And these high points, all of them, are interglacials or warm periods, and we're living in one right now. From one interglacial to the next has a regular rhythm of 100,000 years, and I'll explain why in a second. At no point in the last 800,000 years, and in fact, I can tell you from other, other evidence, in the last 3 million years, has carbon dioxide risen above 280 parts per million. That's the highest natural amount. In 1910, we pushed it to 300 parts per million, and this past March, according to the Mauna Loa Observatory here on this island, it reached 415 parts per million. So Earth's axis of rotation is not stable. It's influenced by the gravity of other planets. And if you look to the left side of this diagram, an instability called obliquity is simply Earth's axis of rotation tipping towards the sun and tipping away from the sun so that there's more sunlight hitting the Arctic and less sunlight hitting the Arctic every 41,000 years. And we also orbit around the sun in eccentricity, the middle cartoon, in a more circular orbit and a more eccentric orbit. So if, if it happens to be summertime where this is the sun, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, it's summer in the northern hemisphere, this eccentricity can mean we're far from the sun or close to the sun even though it's summertime. So we can have a short cold summer or a long warm summer. And the last one, axial precession, is like a top that is slowing down. And that also tips us away and towards the sun. So the Arctic, which is the coldest place on the planet that still has continental land available to be melted in the summer and frozen in the winter, goes from having short cold summers where the amount of snow on the planet builds up and reflects more and more sunlight out to space like this. And as we re reflect more and more sunlight out to space, the planet cools and we go into an ice age. And as these orbital parameters lead to long warm summers, all this bright white snow and ice retreats and we exit an ice age. So this is natural climate change, and the last ice age was about 20,000 years ago. We live in the current warm period called the Holocene, or recent time, interglacial. And these three orbital parameters maximized their heating, made the longest, warmest summers about 8,000 years ago. And since 8,000 years ago, planet Earth has been slowly cooling down into the next ice age. In fact, we've cooled about uh, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. All of this was discovered, by the way, by a Serbian engineer who was a prisoner of war in World War I. And he worked out the math with pencil and paper of Kepler's laws from centuries earlier and he calculated all this stuff, and now we call them Milankovitch cycles because his name was Milutin Milankovitch. So we're going to miss the next ice age because we're now in control of the temperature of the air with our emissions of greenhouse gases. 
As we've said, the warming so far has been about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Portions of the West Antarctic ice sheet I will show you are in irreversible retreat. It will play out over many centuries, though, if we were to stop warming where it is right now. And we talked about the Arctic ice sheet. Um, coral reefs are um, on a trajectory to bleach every year around the planet before mid-century. Mountain glaciers are in a state of retreat. The Amazon rainforest becomes severely threatened by drought at 2 degrees C or uh, 3.8 Fahrenheit. The boreal forest, which is the great northern pine forests, are on the cusp right now of going from absorbing CO2 in photosynthesis to releasing CO2 because of drought and wildfire. And there are other elements of fundamental planetary systems which are threatened at 2 degrees C. 3 degrees C, we start to open up the possibility of the permafrost bomb, which is releasing carbon that's frozen in the Arctic. Our current trajectory of CO2 emissions is taking us to 4 degrees C in the second half of the century. All right, that's the end of chapter one. Human activities now control Earth's climate. How does climate change cause an increase in extreme weather? Global weather disasters have tripled in two decades. And by the way, at the bottom of most of my slides, you'll see a little bit of indecipherable writing. And you can't see it on this, but these are the peer-reviewed scientific papers and reports that um, I'm getting this information from. So this is a simulation of Earth's jet stream. The rainbow colors are high altitude winds, and um, they are normally very linear and stable. But because the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet, the temperature difference between the Arctic and the tropics is reduced. And so the gradient of heat flow or winds in the atmosphere is reduced. And winds are circulating slower. And the jet stream is part of that system. These large meanders in the jet stream, for instance, the meander that is going down over South Carolina and Georgia, pull Arctic air down. And you get record-setting snowfall and record-setting cold temperatures. And this, unfortunately, happens over Washington, D.C. on a regular basis. We've seen a cooling of that area and an increase in snowfall. But it's because of global warming that that's happening. We also see billion-dollar crop disasters, which I'll show you in a second. The meander to the west, the upward meander, pulls hot air up to the north. We get record-setting drought, heat waves, and it fuels wildfires. And if you go on the climate channel uh, any time, you'll often see that continental U.S. has a bipolar weather system. You'll have one thing in the east and another thing in the west, and it's because these meanders follow each other in the jet stream. This is the rise in billion dollar losses in the U.S. since 1980. The purple losses are winter storms and the um, the bright blue cyan losses are freezes. Then we also have wildfire, flooding, drought, tropical cyclones, severe rainstorms, all these losses. Each one is, uh, causes over a billion dollars. And so this is, this is costing the treasury of the federal government as well as local governments. Global extreme rainfall has increased 12%. And at current emissions, 70% of the world population and GDP face a 500% increase in flood impact. These are called rain bombs. This is what extreme rainfall looks like. It's highly focused, highly concentrated. It's so strong, it can actually damage a wood frame. We're 
also experiencing heat waves. When we reach a global average of two degrees C, which again will be before mid-century, temperature will exceed 104 degrees Fahrenheit every year in many parts of Asia, Australia, North Africa, and South and North America. And this is an image from India uh, two summers ago where the temperature reached as high as 120 degrees. Heat waves, in fact, are the deadliest natural disaster in the U.S. And the cities with three consecutive months where maximum temperatures exceed 95 degrees, so every day is a 95 degree day, are shown here. This is today, and this is what it looks like by mid-century. An increase of 800% of human population in urban areas um, exposed to three months of unrelenting 95 degree Fahrenheit days. Um, I've added a few slides here so you won't see every one of these on your handout. Hurricanes and climate change are also an important aspect. Uh, with warmer sea surface temperatures, they provide more fuel for tropical cyclones and hurricanes. They are larger, there is more rain associated with them, they are stronger, they are moving slower Hurricane Dorian a month ago moved over the Bahamas and came to a dead stop. 180 mile per hour winds with gusts of 220 miles per hour for 24 hours. We'd never seen anything like that before. And the storm surge associated with these is higher uh, because they're stronger storms, but also because of sea level rise. And hurricanes and tropical cyclones around the world are shifting away from the equator. That's important for, for us because historically tropical cyclones that have made it out to the central North Pacific uh, generally pass south of the Big Island here. Occasionally they curve north and make contact. But if they're shifting away from the equator, they're coming more into the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. And so 2018 saw this uh, track map. And you see that they're intersecting the Hawaiian Islands more frequently. And you had very dramatic flood flooding here. Uh, on a couple of occasions. Let's look at what a category, I think it was a category four hurricane looks like when it runs aground on a small community. This was Hurricane Michael in October of last year. Pretty much flattens every building that has not been upgraded with the latest building codes. As you know, uh, having a continuous load path from the roof all the way down to the foundation having some freeboard under the house so that water can flow underneath it, uh, having every component of the house vertical and horizontal attached to each other, having windows and doors that won't break open so you don't breach the envelope of the house. These are all building code improvements that will keep a house from um, unzipping in the pressure differences that happen uh, with high winds. So again, almost no fatalities because these folks evacuated. They went to Houston, Atlanta. We don't have that luxury. We don't get to evacuate. We'll know about a hurricane that's running aground, but uh, we don't get to evacuate. So um, knowing that hurricanes are coming, knowing that we cannot stop them, improving building codes, improving electrical codes, 
uh, and even going beyond what the FEMA 100-year um, floodplain, the National Flood Insurance Program, requires in terms of base flood elevations. Add, the, add a couple of feet to that or one foot. We can take strong measures to make ourselves more resilient, and resilient means we come back faster uh, from the hurricane and we get damaged less from the hurricane. Um, a paper has recently come out showing that after a hurricane passes over a community, there's often a heat wave. And so the hurricane will take out the grid, will have a blackout, and then the heat wave hits. And for those who are elderly or young or ill, those heat waves can be extremely dangerous. Uh, without electricity to uh, generate air conditioning, they're extremely dangerous. So public shelters that have ironclad electricity uh, large battery systems for at least 72 hours and that are staged with food and water and that are prepared to handle uh, the waste and sleeping needs of a number of people. These are known as resilience centers. And um, you can find blueprints and ideas for building resilience centers at the American Association of Resiliency Officers. And um, this top little panel shows a computer simulation of present day category four and five storms. You can see our little area there. And then in the bottom, you see a simulation late this century uh, where temperatures have, global temperatures have risen just two to three degrees. You can see the strong increase in the amount of storms in our area. The western U.S. fire season is 150 days longer than 40 days ago, and the number of large fires has tripled. Global extreme weather events are on the rise. Floods are 15-fold more frequent. Drought mortality 10 times. Wildfires 7 times. Extreme temperature events or heat waves 20 times. And these all lead to insured losses. This is from Munich Re. This is the history of insured losses, and insurance companies are not just going to sit around and go out of business. They're going to raise their premiums, and so this drives up the cost of living for everybody on everything, and as you know, almost everything in the Hawaiian Islands is brought in by shipping and is insured, not just the things themselves, but the containers and the ships and the ports. And This is a map of uh, global weather disasters over the last decade. 68% of extreme weather events are more likely or more severe due to climate change. Heat waves constitute 43% of such events, droughts 17%, and heavy rain and flooding 16% of these disasters. Okay, chapter three. Climate change in Hawaii. There's the Kona landscape. We see a 10% increase in land area under drought in our state. Precipitation is decreasing. The rainfall is decreasing 6% per decade over the last 30 years. On Oahu, my island, we've seen a 400% increase in wildfire since the 1960s. Most even 98% of wildfire is set by humans, either on purpose or uh, unintentionally, and invasive grasses play an important role. If there's any rain, invasive grasses will spring up like crazy, and then when the following drought settles in, they die, but they stay there and they constitute uh, fuel for um, wildfires. Sea surface temperatures are increasing especially during El Nino, when the trade winds are low. And we are currently surrounded by a marine heat wave. Marine heat waves have increased 54% since 1925. They occur all over the planet, and they're becoming much more frequent. The current marine heat wave has led to hundreds of record temperatures in Hawaii this past summer. 
On Kauai, August was the hottest month ever on record, and there were 31 days of record highs. On Oahu, August 31st tied the all-time record high, and there were 29 days of record highs this summer. On Maui, a measurement of 97 degrees on July 29th, maybe the highest ever Hawaii temperature measured, and 41 days of record highs. And in Hilo, August was the hottest month on record with 15 days of record-setting highs. We have our rain bombs, too. This system moved over southeast Oahu uh, and dumped a huge amount of water in the Hawaii Kai area and Waimanalo. Most of our streams that have any development are lined with cement. They're called gulches, and uh, the Wailupe Gulch rose eight feet. It, drove, it jumped out of its gulch and went through several homes. On Kauai, you know, this system led to 12 landslides on the only road up into Wainiha and the North Shore communities. It also set a national record for the most rainfall in a 24-hour period. The Hanalei River rose 15 feet, and it jumped out of its channel and went through a small subdivision until it emptied out of Black Pot Beach. Hawaii is getting warmer. The average daily wind speeds are declining. Light and variable, southeast winds, etc., are becoming more common. And the trade winds are coming less often from the northeast and more often from the east. That means they're warmer. And they interact with our topography in a different way, right? Most of our rain comes from trade winds having to climb up to high elevations and condensing to turn into clouds and those clouds precipitate and give us our freshwater aquifers, or they interact with uh, the ecosystems at the top of our watersheds that collect rain from the fog and then drip it into the ground. Uh, as much as 40% of the recharge to aquifers uh, may come from this fog drip, and invasive species are um, displacing this finely tuned ecosystem in our watersheds. And we have sea level rise, which is causing a statewide problem with coastal erosion. As we heard earlier, Antarctic ice is melting. The, the melting rate has tripled in the past five years. The melting is accelerating. That dark red area on Antarctica is West Antarctica. The ice sheets there uh, reach out into the ocean and they float and they're being melted from below by warm water. And as they melt, more water is, more ice flows from behind because the floating ice sheets act like corks in a wine bottle, keeping the rest of the ice bottled up, but now they're flowing faster. Uh, a number of ice sheets or, or glaciers, five of them in West Antarctica are now considered unstoppably retreating but it can play out, in fact, over a thousand years if warming is brought under control. Greenland has seen an increase in melting, and if global temperature reaches 1.8 degrees C, remember it's at 1.1, then that white bluish area, the high plateau of Greenland, will experience summers where it melts, and that will lower the elevation, which increases the probability of more melting, which lowers the elevation, which increases the probability. That, that goes across a tipping point, and the Greenland ice sheet then is engaged in unstoppable melting. That's 1.8 degrees C. Remember, the forecast is for 2 degrees C before mid-century. Another part of sea level rise is the ocean absorbing heat and then expanding thermal expansion, and uh, the ocean is rapidly absorbing heat. In fact, it's interesting to note, if the oceans were not absorbing heat, the amount of greenhouse gas we've already put into the atmosphere would have warmed the surface close to 10 degrees. In other words, life would have already ended the oceans are actually making it possible for us to continue to survive this uh, release of greenhouse gases. So sea level rise uh, looks like this. It 
salt water comes up the drainage system that we have engineered to take rain off our streets. Uh, pipes flow into canals or out into the ocean, but with sea level rise, the salt water comes in at the highest tides of the year. The highest tides of the year uh, for Hawaii tend to occur in the summertime, uh, late in the day. So here you see storm drain backflow in Waikiki. Uh, you also see a little line of sand. This is actually where the beach wants to be, and the, the, at high tide in the summertime, the salt water doesn't just passively flow out here, it actually bursts out as waves break. And you see salt water flowing away down the gutter. We also know that the water table under our feet is connected to the ocean. It goes up and down with the tides. So when it's high tide in the ocean, the water table is high. And at the highest tides of the year, the water table in Waikiki and Kaka'ako and all the way to Pearl Harbor is only two feet below the ground level. And that two feet is what we put there when we dredged the Alawai Canal and the Ala Moana Swim Channel and we did a lot of dredging. So that two feet we've put there. So otherwise, in a natural state, Waikiki and Kaka'ako would be wetlands, which is what they used to be. But when this water table rises to the ground surface, we will have wetlands once again, but it will occur first just for half an hour at a high tide, and then the tide goes down, and then the occurrence of these wetlands will get more and more frequent. So if it happens to rain, and we do get rain bombs, especially during El Nino years, and it's late in the evening when everybody's commuting to go home, and it's in the summertime, so we have our highest tides. We have no place for this rain to drain. And this is Dillingham Boulevard in Honolulu. And uh, this sort of flash flooding brings the, the afternoon, evening commute to a standstill. Parents are not able to go pick up their kids. Teachers are not allowed to leave kids and go get their own children. Uh, Folks at home that are waiting for their caretakers and the rest of their family to come home are isolated. And the cars you see here heading out to the Waianae coast didn't get home until 1 or 2, 2 a.m. in the morning. This has real medical effects for those who rely on family members to take care of them. So this is Waikiki and Kaka'ako. Um, in color-coded flooding from my research team. In blue will be seawater simply flowing over the shoreline. Green will be our drainage backflow, and purple will be groundwater forming new wetlands. Uh, there's one foot of sea level rise at high tide, two, three, four, and five. The red lines are roads that are brought to a standstill. Uh, there's an engineering standard of six inches. The pink dots are individual storm drains that are flooded and no longer functional. And between two and three feet, we see a significant increase in the amount of flooding that takes place. You shut down a dramatically greater uh, amount of roadway and flood a dramatically greater part of the urban core here. We also know that uh, we receive waves associated with the seasons. And um, these we all enjoy and go and surf. Uh, in the summertime, they come from the Southern Hemisphere. And this is the town of Eva Beach on the south shore of Oahu. With two feet of sea level rise, you see the average summer wave uh, running up into the community. You see dozens of homes being flooded. But at three feet of sea level rise, every single summer, the entire Eva Beach community is going to be receiving uh, these large waves, this flooding. So again, here's a building code initiative where you have freeboard under the house. But really, since we know there's a 10% probability of reaching six and a half feet this century, is this a building code initiative or is this a relocation question? By the way, 10% may not strike you as a lot, but if every 10th airplane crashed into the ground or every 10th aspirin caused a stroke, you know, 10% is enough to make some very serious decisions. And when it comes to hundreds of millions of dollars of treasure and people's lives and homes, 
um, that's sufficient to make a decision. Okay, so climate change has effects on uh, food and water security, which in turn lead to violent conflict. We already have a global freshwater crisis. By 2030, global water requirements just by human population and drought will exceed sustainable water supplies by 40%. And we're already withdrawing water from our aquifers faster than nature can replace it. So on the mainland, we're pulling 17% more water out of our aquifers than is replaced every year. China is pulling an average of 22%, India 52%, and in North Africa and the Middle East, they're pulling thousands of percent more out of their aquifers than is replaced every year. And by 2050, with growing human population and shifting drought, uh, water demand is projected to grow by over half. Many people don't realize that um, soy, corn, rice, um, and wheat, when, are, when they are grown under higher CO2 levels, such as we have already created, uh, have less protein, less zinc, less vitamin B complex, and less iron, so the food is less nutritious. Based on this, by 2050, an additional 300 million people will be malnourished, and one and a half billion women and children likely to have anemia, iron deficiency. Let's look at wheat as an example. Global wheat currently provides 20% of all human protein. But the yield is threatened by climate change, drought, flood, and decreasing nutrition with higher carbon dioxide. The demand for wheat is set to increase 60% by mid-century, but the actual yield is projected to decline by 15%. At two degrees C, we see a uh, rapidly emerging novel era of hot extremes for most tropical countries. And what's mapped here is um, historically unprecedented daytime and nighttime combined heat uh, that will be registered every other year within the next one to three decades. So this is underway. And the situation here is that at nighttime, there's no relief. That's what this is saying. All of this drives the tropics to be uh, less livable. And there is, in fact, a fatal boundary with heat, a combination of 95 degrees Fahrenheit and 90% humidity uh, prevents the body from offloading heat to the air. The humidity is like a thin blanket on your skin, and so heat is trapped. And if the body, which is an engine, can't offload heat, it overheats and we experience heat disease. Uh, so at this combination of 95 and 90, um, heat disease starts to take over if you're outside for a couple of hours. So we have food shortages, water shortages, we have heat disease. Um, this can lead to violent conflict and this drives people from their homelands. We almost have 1% of all humanity currently in a refugee state. People leaving North Africa, leaving portions of the Middle East, people leaving Latin America uh, because climate change has either put their crops out of commission or is leading to freshwater problems. And Syria is a perfect example we have studies of Syria which show that in the early 2000s, there was a thousand year drought. And that uh, brought to a close the farming uh, component of Syria. And we had millions of farming families moving off of their failed farms into Aleppo and Homs and Damascus. And there they discovered the corrupt government of President Bashar al-Assad. There, were, there was no education available, food was scarce, there was no medical, uh, jobs didn't exist. And so the young men in these farming families uh, created a civil war. 
At the same time, the U.S. was pushing Al Qaeda out of Afghanistan and out of Iraq. Al Qaeda moved into Syria, and we had presidential forces, we had rebel forces, and we had Al Qaeda forces. And they were all fighting each other. Russia stepped in as well, and plus we played a role behind the curtain. And out of this chaos came ISIS. Four million people fled Syria. And they either traveled to the north through Turkey and had to cross the Aegean Sea or to the south through Egypt and into Libya where they crossed the Mediterranean Sea. And smugglers put them in unseaworthy boats. They overloaded the boats. Uh, they'd take them out to the three-mile limit and they'd often pull the uh, outboard engine and they would hope that the French Coast Guard, Italian Coast Guard, would rescue these folks. And most of the time that did take place. But we also had tragedies. We had enormous tragedies take place. And in the space of a few hours, families lost loved ones. Those who made it ashore uh, experienced unspeakable tragedy. These folks were headed for the EU where uh, the borders are open. And they moved uh, through the European Union. And at first, Germany welcomed 1.1 million asylum seekers and distributed, distrib distributed them across the countryside to towns and villages. But it can become too much. And communities became overwhelmed by these folks wanting uh, new homelands. This led to the rise of a new class of politicians um, demagogues who identified uh, the asylum seekers, the refugees, as the cause of problems for uh, everybody in their country. These tribalists or nationalists or populists uh, were not elected into office, but they rose much higher into the ranks. And so this represented a class of authoritarian political figures that we hadn't seen since the 1930s. This guy did get elected, Sebastian Kurz. He campaigned on closed borders. And overall, we've seen a rise in authoritarian governments around the world in response to not only the refugee pressure, but also the, uh, the need to address climate disasters to take place where democratic norms are suspended and then uh, these leaders do not reinstate them. So the U.S. military is well aware of this, and let's look at a little video uh, of a movie about this. We built society on this assumption of climate stability, and that stability is changing. All these things we take for granted, they're not just givens anymore. The just released report from the Pentagon climate change and the challenges it's creating for the military. The latest report says global warming is driving weather to new levels of extremes. 99% of my intelligence told me there's an ambush waiting for me. I don't get to say, yeah, but there's that 1% that says there's no ambush. So the hell with the other 99%. As a member of the United States military in 30 plus years of service in uniform, climate change is what we call an accelerant to instability. If you have an area that is already unstable and then has the additional challenge of water shortages or food shortages or a disaster that makes people move, then you can start seeing conflict situations. Syria's deadly conflict, a full-blown civil war. If we look around the world today, we can already see conflict and climate in play right under the headlines that we're reading. A new study finds climate change exacerbated the worst drought ever in modern Syria as a consequence of human interference. Fragile social systems just need one more shock to tip them over the edge into social breakdown, into war. Failure to think about how climate change might impact our globally interconnected system is a failure of imagination. The flip side of the climate threat is the energy and resilience opportunity. As a soldier, we're always looking to have an edge on the future. We can pay now, pay later.
right, chapter five. <clears throat> and because we uh, discharge our partially treated sewage in the coastal zone, when a uh, coral community bleaches and has lost its defensive mechanism, it's quickly overtaken by fleshy algae, by weeds, if you will, that thrive on the nutrients that we dump into the coastal zone. These invasive species are more and more taking over our reef community. And in fact, we're seeing a phenomenon of reef collapse. Um, bleaching leads to death of the coral. And if you kill off all the coral, they don't just come back. The ecosystem is not that resilient. And so um, there, you no longer have coral secreting the hard uh, calcification of the reef and it columbers, uh, collapses under the pounding of seasonal waves, it collapses into just a field of gravel. This is actually off of Maui. And permafrost um, is collapsing. We're seeing these lakes called thermokarst. Um, they're arising 70 years sooner than the models had projected. Humanity has caused the loss of 83% of all wild mammals and 50% of wild plants. And we're deforesting the planet. We are also now aware of a crash in the insect population. Uh, the number of insect species has decreased by about one third. A researcher is quoted as saying a decline on that scale over just 10 years came as a complete surprise. It's frightening, but fits the picture presented in a growing number of studies. We have dangerous new hot zones that are already reaching 2 degrees C, and they're on the continental areas. And just this past year, we've had uh, wildfire in the great pine forests of the north. Uh, California fires caused a purposeful blackout by PG&E &E of one million people experienced a loss of electricity. This past summer, the US East, uh, US East Coast experienced a heat wave. We are under a marine heat wave. The Amazon is on fire with 2.2 million acres having been lost. Europe experienced three heat waves this past summer. That's a first. Kuwait reached 130 degrees Fahrenheit this past summer. We had a mega fire in the Siberian, 30 million acres on fire. It, the um, Russian government didn't bother sending anybody in to try and fight it because it was just too large. Uh, the city of Chennai, India, with 10 million people, a mega city, ran out of water. And there are stories of families unable to take uh, some of their elderly with them and just having to leave them. And Australia, last week and the week before, uh, we had 8 million people put under a state of emergency and suburbs of Sydney were threatened with wildfire. 2.7 million acres. We're also seeing mass animal mortality events. In 2015, in the space of one day, 200,000 antelope collapsed and died in Kazakhstan from blood poisoning uh, due to the heat. 45,000 flying foxes died in one day in Australia. Hundreds of millions of starfish on the U.S. West Coast were wiped out over the course of a year. 800,000 puffins and auklets starved to death because uh, effects to the marine food chain and fish had moved to new locations. 50 or 5,000 birds of 10 different species all in one day collapsed from excess heat in a location in India. This is a small sample of what's being witnessed. There are actually hundreds of these. Globally, the wildlife population has decreased by 60% in recent decades. Of all mammals on Earth, 96% by weight are cows and people. Only 4% of mammals are wild. 
Seventy percent of all birds are chickens and other types of poultry. Scientists are having to find new words to describe their research. We're describing a sixth mass extinction taking place on the planet. Scientists' career is built on establishing trust and being a trusted reporter. And we are, when you are driven to use words like biological annihilation, um, it means that the data on this is overwhelming. Has land use, meaning deforestation and agricultural lands, pushed terrestrial biodiversity beyond a planetary boundary? Approaching a state shift in Earth's biosphere. Marine defaunation. Animal loss in the global ocean. Climate-related local extinctions are already widespread among plant and animal species. These are top-notch journals, too. Top-notch journals. having occurred in hundreds of species, including 47% of nearly 1,000 species surveyed in this study from the top of the watershed all the way into the uh, marine ecosystem. This paper has 15,000 scientific co-authors, and it was a warning. And it says, humans have pushed Earth's ecosystems to their breaking point and are well on the way to ruining the planet. You may have noticed this piece of art that I'm using for transition. This is a senior capstone project from Christiana M., a senior at Punahou School. Um, she calls this ecological grief, and this ecological grief is now a, an official psychosis. Um, it hits climate scientists first, who are embedded in this knowledge. Uh, but as everybody learns about this, um, they experience that emotion. Are we solving the climate crisis? So you've seen basically this graph already. Um, historical CO2 em emissions accelerating through time and the need to have them dramatically fall to stop warming at 1.5 degrees uh, C, they actually need to reach zero and we need to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's called carbon sequestration. The truth is that progress is falling well short of the Paris Agreement, the United Nations Treaty in 2015, where everybody, every nation signed on board to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And what everybody signed on to is actually only one third of the reductions that are needed to stop uh, at two degrees C. And today, less than 1% of the population of the planet is in full compliance with the uh, United Nations. And the truth is that because the developing nations are uh, building themselves a safe and secure world using fossil fuels, fossil fuel use is accelerating faster than re uh, renewable energy use. And the various solutions of transportation and um, grid resiliency, these are irregular. Um, there's no global consistency to them. We have to end carbon emissions, we have to pull about a trillion tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere, and we have to adapt to weather disasters that we've put into play. And any one of these represents a massive, expensive, radical change um, for us. Last year, unfortunately, CO2 emissions rose 2.7% globally. Uh, and it was the first time in 20 years that the growth in renewable power failed to increase. There are a number of outlooks that come from various global economists. 
Uh, the International Energy Agency says that the demand for new energy is set to grow over 25% over the next two decades. Renewables make up only about two-thirds of this capacity. Oil consumption continues to grow due to rising demand for plastics, trucking, aviation, and energy. And they project CO2 emissions continuing to increase. Another uh, organization, this is a congressionally mandated group called Resources for the Future. It was established in the 1960s. Uh, it is meant to be a nonpartisan uh, institution. Uh, their report this past summer says that on the global trend, global energy consumption, consumption will grow 20 to 30 percent or more, led largely by fossil fuels, and that global economy becomes more energy efficient over time, although not enough to overcome carbon dioxide emissions or to replace carbon dioxide emissions. Renewable energy grows rapidly, though it primarily adds to rather than displaces fossil fuels. And electric vehicles play an important role, but their effect is to restrain the growth of rather than lead to a decline in oil demand. So we must reject the assumption that scaling up clean energy will automatically replace fossil fuels. Historically, new energy sources have added to older ones. Oil and gas didn't replace coal. They were added on top. And the same is happening now. Another independent agency, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, projects CO2 emissions growing six-tenths of a percent per year, continuing to mid-century. And this cluster of rising emissions to the year 2040 comes from BP, uh, Equinor, ExxonMobil, International Energy Agency, Shell Sky, a number of projections. And the U.S. Energy Information Administration describes the future market share of fossil fuels to renewables in the year 2040 as basically being the same as it is today. These are all the different pathways uh, that we could follow into different futures. We're currently on a pathway to 4 degrees C uh, by the 2080s. What are the solutions? We know how to solve this crisis. That's our current trend to mid-century. And each one of these colored bands represents a solution. Nations have actually stated that they want to follow this red area, but they are in fact following the black arrow. And to follow what we have promised in Paris, we have to follow the green arrow. But all these little colorful slices are improvements in efficiency, uh, using biofuels, hydropower, nuclear power, electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So the technology, the solution to this problem is extremely well known. Batteries have plummeted in price. They've come down 85% in price since 2009. And uh, our utilities are embracing these. We're deploying batteries into the field, accompanying solar panels and windmills. We also have Greta Thunberg, the Swedish 16-year-old who is leading the global strikes. And we have Extinction Rebellion, which is another group dedicated to nonviolent social disruption. Uh, they've put out this little video. This is not a drill. My name is Greta Thunberg. We are living in the beginning of a mass extinction. Our climate is breaking down. Children like me are giving up their education to protest. But we can still fix this. You can still fix this. To survive, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. But this alone will not be enough. Lots of solutions are talked about. But what about a solution that is right in front of us? I'll let my friend George explain. There is a magic machine that sucks carbon out of the air, costs very little, 
and builds itself. It's called a tree. A tree is an example of a natural climate solution. Mangroves, peat bogs, jungles, marshes, seabeds, kelp forests, swamps, coral reefs, they take carbon out of the air and lock it away. Nature is a tool we can use to repair our broken climate. These natural climate solutions could make a massive difference. Pretty cool, right? But only if we also leave fossil fuels in the ground. Here's the crazy part. Right now, we are ignoring them. We spend 1,000 times more on global fossil fuel subsidies than on natural-based solutions. Natural climate solutions get just 2% of all the money used on tackling climate breakdown. This is your money. It is your taxes and your savings. Even more crazy, right now, when we need nature the most, we're destroying it faster than ever. Up to 200 species are going extinct every single day. Much of the Arctic ice is gone. Most of our wild animals have gone. Much of our soil has gone. So what should we do? What should you do? It's simple. We need to protect, restore and fund. Protect. Tropical forests are being cut down at the rate of 30 football pitches a minute. Where nature is doing something vital, we must protect it. Restore. Much of our planet has been damaged. But nature can regenerate, and we can help ecosystems bounce back. Fund. We need to stop funding things that destroy nature and pay for things that help it. It is that simple. Protect, restore, fund. This can happen everywhere. Many people have already begun using natural climate solutions. We need to do it on a massive scale. You can be part of this. Vote for people who defend nature. Share this video. Talk about this. All around the world, there are amazing movements fighting for nature. Join them. Everything counts. What you do counts. Uh, another little video on what appropriate farming looks like. What if I told you that the most promising technology we have to address climate change is growing on 3.6 billion acres across planet Earth. The ability of agricultural soils to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and hold it in the soil is literally the most optimistic thing I know about with regard to climate change. Today's agricultural soils contain about 1% carbon. Prior to cultivation, those soils contained about 3% carbon. If we could take every cultivated acre on Earth, which is about three and a half billion acres, and get them back from one to three percent, that would represent sequestering about one trillion tons of carbon dioxide pulled out of the atmosphere by plants and put back into the soil. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the Earth's atmosphere had about 280 parts per million. The most recent reading on the current concentration in the atmosphere is about 415 parts per million. If you take that difference and multiply times the Earth's atmosphere, that means there's about one trillion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today that wasn't in the atmosphere prior to humans starting to burn coal and oil. One trillion tons of carbon dioxide. It represents both the scale of the problem and the scale of the potential solution. The Terraton Initiative seeks to remove a trillion tons or a teraton of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and into agricultural soils. So how do agricultural soils actually capture carbon dioxide gas from the atmosphere and store it in the soil? The answer, as you probably remember from eighth grade, is photosynthesis. They attract carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, use sunlight combined with chlorophyll and turn that into sugars. And many of those sugars then go through the roots and into the soil where they feed other living things in the soil. And over time, 
those living things continue to increase and we increase the carbon concentration in the soil. We know that we can do this because there are farmers who are doing it today. It includes using no-till practices, using cover crops, more crop rotation. But we believe that at a cost of about $15 to $20 a ton, we would provide significant incentives for farmers to change practices and begin to sequester carbon, and that would represent a much lower cost than the alternatives. There are many solutions we should be pursuing to reduce the effect of climate change and reverse it. But sequestering atmospheric carbon in agricultural soils represents the only solution I know of that is scalable, economical, and immediate. So what will it take to make this happen? It includes farmers being willing to experiment with new ways of growing, businesses and all of us as consumers being willing to pay for it, and in fact demanding that our food and products are produced this way. And it requires that innovators come up with new ways of sampling soil, measuring carbon, coming up with products that replace a lot of the chemicals that are fertilizers that are used today. Success in the Terraton Initiative will require collaboration from within the agricultural industry and from outside of the industry. But it's completely within our hands. We're not waiting for a new technical breakthrough. We don't need advances that aren't here today. We just have to decide collectively that we're gonna make it happen. So I'm just about done. Um, I want you to know that eating plant-based foods is the most powerful personal way to reduce your impact on the planet. Simply increasing uh, the plant component uh, of your diet. So eat a more plant-based diet. Talk about climate change. I get climate news every morning. Here are a couple of links that send me news. Vote to repair the climate, to protect natural ecosystems, and to improve the resiliency of our communities. And our communities need to move together. Uh, it's not just about personal action, it's about collective action. And I want to thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, okay, first of all, thank you very much. I appreciate the presentation. Um, before we get into a question and answer, we're going to take a seven minute break. Just been at this for a couple hours. So, you know, I conjure up a lot of stuff in this brain of mine from time to time. And they're all frightening things, so much so that my wife has told me that I live in a scary world. I hate to think. Uh, uh, I'm just kind of wondering what your wife tells you. <laughs> because this was even more frightening than I could conjure up, really. <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah, and you know, um, Dr. Fletcher, I, I don't know, um, you, you know, you're from Oahu, but, you know, I, I've been receiving a good amount of ribbing lately because of some comments that I made. Uh, a few weeks ago about the future of our planet. Basically, I said it's too late. It's not to say that you know we should give up hope or, or not try, but uh, as far as reversing it, I think you know maybe 10,000, 20,000 years from now, you know, but we're just pretty much staving off the inevitable. You know, I don't see glaciers coming back anytime soon in our lifetime. It's just not happening. But having said that, though, um, thank you very much for this, this in-depth primer on climate change. Very eye-opening. I, I never really, you know, I had intuitively thought that, you know, it had, um, you know, global warming, climate change had some effects, not just on our environment, but socioeconomic stuff. And then you really brought it to light. I mean, when you talked about, you know, political upheaval and, and things and, you know, just governments being changed on, on that basis. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, Thank you. But now I'm going to bring it back more local, okay? Uh, two years ago, you, you and um, Josh Stansborough and other, others you know, had a talk at the uh, Hawaii State Association for 
of counties annual conference. And um, I am hoping that you'll be able to also attend and give a presentation at our um, conference, which is occurring next year, June. But we'll, we'll talk to you about that. I'd love I mean, to. Because it's kind of good, you know, two years ago, but a lot has changed, you know, over the last two years. So you can Scott give an Parker. update on, on that, right? I mean, it's, uh, you, you can never have uh, enough of these types of presentations, in, in my opinion. But um, you, you, you and I had a brief chat, and the two things that I thought were interesting uh, as it related to our island and our estate were that, and correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, Karen and I were on the radio one day, and then, you know, I actually described you as being, in my opinion, the preeminent authority on climate change in our state, maybe even beyond. Thank you. Um, but I, if I recall correctly, things that stood out in my mind were, and I could have been wrong now, one, and you, you showed it in your uh, presentation, the path of future hurricanes. Mm. And I think you told me, it was just a short chat, that what we really have to look out for now is where, whereas in the past, hurricanes would just kind of go past us and even go maybe south, veer south. But because of climate change, we run the risk of, well, the future holds in store for us uh, a scenario whereby hurricanes will come towards Hawaii, kind of linger for a while, and shoot up straight north. And that's what was indicated in your charts. And that's, this was two years ago, and that's kind of what happened with Hurricane Lane, actually. So when that happened, I was thinking, hey, that's what Dr. Fletcher said. And so on that point, are, is, is that something we're going to have to expect now? So minor correction. Okay. Um, so the, the pathways are shifting away from the equator, which puts them more along the same latitude of the, as the Hawaiian Islands. And they are moving slower, and they're stronger. Um, they're... The shooting north bit is not correct. Okay. Um, they will go in different directions based on what the, the steering winds um, will determine. But the basic point is that we are much more vulnerable to tropical storms, which are bad as well, right. uh, and hurricanes, yes. But when I looked at this chart that you had presented, the 2018 hurricane mm -hmm. season, it seemed to indicate that they were all moving up north. So the pathways are shifting to the north, but um, I took your language to mean that they're taking a hard bend yeah. and heading due north. That, that's what I had that's not the thought case. that you meant, but I, I see what you mean now. But um, is there a tendency for it to linger? They're moving north? slower. Slower, which is not good, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in that sense, we have to be prepared. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the other one was that, and perhaps I got this wrong, that in terms of sea level rise, and, you know, we have to take precautions, of course, you know, in terms of planning and building codes and other things, but unless I totally misunderstood what you said, um, you, s you told me that actually the Big Island was in in that bad shape. Yeah, that's my opinion. You have a lot more topography, your coastline. Uh -huh. You don't have broad, low-lying coastal plains that used to be wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, the island is subsiding. Your island is subsiding. So the rate of sea level rise here is greater than Oahu. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of your infrastructure is up away from the coast. Um, the withdrawal of Hilo community following the tsunamis 50, 60 years ago has opened up a great safety zone there that really does a lot of, provides a lot of protection for you. Uh, Department of Transportation is aware of sea level impacts to your ports and um, is evaluating those statewide, in fact. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have some localized uh, sea level exposure, and you have uh, beach erosion, but you're in far better shape than mm -hmm. islands to the north. 
Well, yeah, and speaking of the Department of Transportation, you know, I was once alerted to a study, and you know, you're probably more privy to th this kind of information, where at least one person, and it might be an extremist view, though, actually suggested, are you familiar with Hilo? Are you familiar with Hilo and the, the roads there? I don't know individual yeah. streets, but yes, okay. I've been there a couple dozen times. Well, someone actually suggested, and I think it was a study done for the Department of Transportation, which suggested that we have to take precautions for a sea level rise all the way up to about Komohana Street, you know. Where's that? That's a major arterial um, connecting, uh, and you know, I could be wrong, maybe it was Kinoole, but it was something way inland. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, that. And I'm not saying area, that they were correct. I'm just wondering sure. if you knew of anything like the that. The open area there in front of the main commercial district is very low lying, and you have mm -hmm. ponds. Those are sources of flooding. They flow out of their uh, banks. Uh, the sort of set of gas stations over mm -hmm. um, in that area are they're flooded already uh, on certain occasions. But when you come into the commercial district, you have sort of that front street area, and then things quickly move uphill. Uh -huh. So I don't think anything on the uphill portion is threatened. Okay. And even that, you know, seaward most line of the commerce is in pretty good shape for a while, yeah. provided okay. Antarctica behaves. All right, all right. Well, that's good to know, <laughs> because I do view you as being the preeminent man in Thank this you. field. Okay, but thank you very much for coming. May I here. make a short comment on sure, your view sure. of the future? You can, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to go head to head with uh, the preeminent man on uh, climate change. You got your own cartoon. It is my view, and you know, I, I will say this, and it was based on this um, population. You know, when I looked at this chart here, um, one of the first charts that you showed had to do with CO2 emissions, yeah. I think. And that started from, the, the chart was from 1880, I believe, right? Correct. And you know, I'm not an expert in this area. Everything I, I do is based on intuition. But I bet that if you charted the world population, mm -hmm from 1880 to now, it would resemble this chart where you go from maybe 1850, it's going up, and all of a sudden, exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that you know, really changing anytime soon. And that's why I think, yeah, I'm not saying we should give up hope. And I'm not saying we shouldn't try to do whatever we can to hold this thing off. My feeling is we're not reversing it. I mean, but that's only my feeling. Right. Human, Go ahead. Pop, human population growth is an enormous driver of all of this, both the climate change itself and then as an additional factor. Um, I, I uh, don't believe that we are going to suddenly decrease our carbon emissions. I don't believe that we're going to stop warming at two degrees. I think we'll reach three degrees I, I, I see signs that we will stop between two and three degrees. We're currently on track for four degrees. Um, I, there's a concept. Um, so as we approach two degrees, there are a number of economists that are saying that the world will start to realize the climate crisis later on in the decade of the 2020s, late in the 2020s. Um, and as warming progresses beyond there, we may see a uh, decline or a total end to global trade. If we see an end to global trade, our set of islands here needs to be strongly self-sufficient. And there's a, ter a ter term that a futurist uh, uses, Dwayne Elgin. He describes lifeboat communities. He describes communities that are ready for what's coming and that have great self-sufficiency for energy and food and manufacturing and that in fact uh, can really thrive. Um, 
The ideal setting for a lifeboat community of Pu'u Honua, if you will, is one that is not on a continent and is far from any international borders because it's these border zones which are already turning into conflict regions. Uh, Hawaii is extremely well suited for that. And I don't really look at our strong efforts in building renewable energy as important for the climate change issue. I look at, at it as important for our own resiliency in a future that's going to be very difficult for us. We're lagging behind in the area of food production and I think there's a lot we can do there. Um, the same futurist describes coming out at the end of the century, our grandchildren having a profound appreciation and respect for each other and the earth. And in fact, we're looking at the end of a 50,000 year long experiment during which humanity thought that it was separate from nature and it's a failed experiment and humanity will realize we have to go back to nature. I believe we'll do it in a fully digital, modern, technologically advanced way, but we won't look at nature from an extractive point of view anymore. We will look at it as truly a uh, familiar, loving relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think all these aspects Hawaii has in spades, right? And it's, a, it's sort of a beautiful hypothesis. The dark part is that there's a lot of pain between here and now and global population is going to have to decrease. But, so I think Hawaii's uh, well suited, uh, but we still have a lot more work to do. Very well said. But thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilman Eoff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you again, Dr. Fletcher, for taking time to um, come here today and um, give us such a in-depth analysis of what we're looking at today. Um, I think, well, I really appreciate what you just said because I feel that you perfectly articulated the reason why we have hope and the reason why Hawaii Island or Hawaii, the state of Hawaii is um, going in the right direction with all of our um, sort of progressive trends that we're starting to look at. So I feel very, very, very I'm hopeful and I'm so glad you just put that out there because I was also getting kind of depressed earlier about an hour ago um, looking at the facts that you presented so um, it is alarming and um, you know, I thank my uh, fellow council members for getting us to this point today too we've we've done several initiatives along the way that made us ready to hear what you had to say and mm -hmm. Um, what, what I would like to ask you is, I know you've done um, more extensive work on other islands, like I think Maui and Kauai, as far as um, helping um, draft new policies regarding um, some of the ways that we can be more prepared um, in our long-range planning efforts and building codes, et cetera. Is that something you can work with us on, or can um, I work with you on um, maybe starting a ball rolling in certain um, Important, most important areas. Yeah, absolutely. As, I would love to. I mean, I don't think that, uh, I'm not sure if all the islands, I know we don't have a separate um, sort of like climate change or resiliency department. Other islands may already have that. I don't know whether we um, would be in the right um, time to create a new department, but maybe a division of a department. Is something we could work towards to more consolidate our, our efforts? So uh, Honolulu has an Office of Climate Change Susta Sustainability and Resiliency, and it was a voting initiative that was voted in with a margin of 17%, which is, which is very high. Uh, and at the same time, they created a Climate Change Commission. And there are five scientists, or four scientists, and one um, head of an architectural company uh, on the Climate Change Commission. And we uh, write white papers uh, with our opinions on various things. We've provided guidance on sea level rise. We've provided a climate change brief, which is a quick reference to a lot of the discouraging things I said here today. <clears throat> and we're in the midst of issuing a white paper on a new setback law, which is that no build zone from the shoreline to um, where you are allowed to develop the land. Um, we have plans for architecture, white papers, uh, for social equity, white papers, and others. Maui and Kauai do not have 
departments or commissions like that. There is a state commission for climate change, and that is staffed not by resource persons, but by department heads, the governor's executive heads that he's appointed. They meet quarterly. Um, our climate change commission meets at least monthly and, and sometimes more often. We have no authority. We simply crank out ideas. Right. <laughs> well, that's important, though. And um, I, I know what you, you mean um, about this island, our topography, et cetera, but we still do have a lot of low-lying areas, and we mm. have inf aging infrastructure in areas that may be affected by sea um, level or saltwater intrusion, et cetera. And we do have a wetland and pond system on the west side of this island. Mm 